All right, last week we were looking in, uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, pop that up there, in verses 3 to 12, there Paul, he rebuts the claim that was falsely attributed to him, that the day of the Lord had already occurred, and he does that by reminding them that Jesus won't return until the rebellion and the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, until he's revealed. And since that hadn't, occur- hadn't occurred, then the claim that Jesus had already returned was false. And he says at the end of that section that those who are deceived by the miracles that will be associated with this end-time figure, I suggested to you the same figure as Antichrist, but those who will be deceived by those miracles, uh, they do so because they didn't love the truth. And if they had loved the truth... They wouldn't have believed the lie that this figure is divine, regardless of what miracles were performed on his behalf. As soon as they heard this claim that Jesus is divine and that this person is uh, do all worship, they just said, eh. And so he ends it that way. Now let's pick back up in, in 13 to 17. As I say, I'm going to try to get through here. I might be talking a little bit fast, but there you go. All right, he says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because God chose you, the firstfruits, for salvation by sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. For this purpose, He called you through our gospel. For what purpose? For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions which you were taught, whether by our word or by our letter. And may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Now, in in chapter 2, verses 10 10 and 11, he speaks of those who perish under the deception of Antichrist because they didn't love the truth so that they may be saved. See, condemnation. It's for those who didn't love the truth, but delighted in wickedness. That's what he says in in 2, 10, and 11. But the Thessalonians, they're not in that category. You see, those are the types of people who will be condemned. But rather than condemnation, God chose them, as he has chosen all Christians, for salvation, which he accomplishes through the sanctifying work of the Spirit in association with their belief in the truth. They're accepting and trusting in the gospel message. They are then sanctified by the Spirit, and that is the process of salvation. So he says, there are other things in store for you. This is what's in store for those who are like that, but that's not so for you. Because you are among the redeemed, and accepting the reading first fruits, in verse 13, you could take that a different way, and some do, they take it as from the beginning, but accepting the reading first fruits instead of some from the beginning I see it as a reference to the fact that those to whom he's writing in Thessalonica, those Christians, that they are the first Christians in Thessalonica. As with the offering of first fruits at the temple, as first fruits there, the idea is that they foreshadow a future greater harvest. That's the significance of first fruits. That you're the first fruit of the harvest, which you're a promise of more to come. And I think he's talking to this initial Thessalonian group that that's who they are, their first fruits in that sense. And the fact that Thessalonians are among the redeemed, it's cause for regular thanksgiving. That's You see that throughout, that this is God's work. It's called for that. God called them to salvation, he says in verse 14, through the missionary's gospel. That's how God called them to salvation. The message is the means by which people are saved. And that's the impetus, let me play with this, that's the impetus for evangelism. That's, he calls them to salvation through that message. And that's what drives us to tell people about it. And the purpose of God's calling them through the gospel, he says, was, was that they may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Gary Shogren says in his commentary, he says, glory is a Pauline symbol of the final resurrection. Believers will enter glory in the kingdom 
In the end, they will glorify Christ, but also be glorified by him. Glory is sought by the righteous. The saints hope for it. As in 2 Thessalonians 2, it is the goal of God's election and call. The resurrection body is a body of glory. We looked at that last week. The genitive of, of our Lord Jesus Christ has two possibilities. Source, Jesus will give you glory. Or descriptive, glory like that which Jesus has. The parallel in that other Macedonian letter, Philippians 3.21, suggests the second option. Christians will receive a body like his glorious body. And that's ultimately what's in store. There is the intermediate state if we die before the Lord returns, but ultimately there's resurrection life in a new heaven and new earth, and it's a wonderful thing. And he says that he saved you, he redeemed you with that ultimate purpose in mind. And in verse 15, in light of what God has done for the Thessalonians, his blessing them through the gospel, which is a divine work, and it's a divine work that demands the missionary's constant thanksgiving for the Thessalonians. And I just don't think we look at it that way. So here he sees this, God is working among them, and because of that, he feels obligated to give thanks to God continually. And in light of that, Paul calls them to do right by God. In light of what God has done among them, he calls them to do right by God by standing firm through holding fast to the traditions as they had been taught, meaning the divine truths. When we say tradition, you and I typically think man-made stuff. Well, that's not how he's using it. He's talking about holding fast to the divine truths the missionaries had passed on to them, truths that were standard traditional teaching in the larger Christian community. In other words, they are orthodox teaching. That's what he's talking about, you see. He's exhorting them not to be easily shaken from that teaching. Not to be easily shaken from that, from basic orthodoxy, as chapter 2, verse 2, shows they were inclined to do with regard to the second coming. Right? They had, been, they had had this message given to them. And what they do? They heard something, it rattled them, they went and followed that, tried to shoehorn Paul's earlier things into it. And he's telling them not to do that. You see, to hold fast to this, this orthodoxy that they'd been given. And those truths, which include here, he's thinking about the standard teaching about Christ's return, had been passed on to them both by the missionary's word, which was their oral teaching when they had been among the Thessalonians, and also by their letter, which is a clear reference to the letter of 1 Thessalonians. And he's admonishing them not to twist what they had been taught and to force it to conform to some sketchy claim that he's now saying something inconsistent with that. You see, that's how I'm reading what's happening. They had delivered to them this solid, traditional, orthodox teaching, both orally and in 1 Thessalonians. And then somebody has come, come and claimed that, well, no, 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 Paul's now saying this. And instead of using this, what they had been delivered unquestionably from Paul, to judge what was being given to them as inconsistent, they took that and then tried to cram this into it. And he's telling them, you had the teaching, use that to judge this other claim that I'm now saying something inconsistent with that. Use that. Don't take that sketchy claim and then turn around and use that then to twist what I had told you before. You know, don't, don't work it. Don't work. Go the other way. Take what had been delivered to you and use that as a test for this other teaching. So I think that's what he's saying. And then in 16 and 17, they pray that the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, that he will encourage their hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word, and as in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul again, he indicates both the distinction and the unity of Jesus and God the Father. And he does it, the latter, the unity, in the same way, by using singular verbs with a compound subject. And I pointed that out before. Now we have some of that in, in English. 
So here he takes a compound subject and uses two singular verbs. And he just does it without explanation. So he again, he, you, you see the distinction of person, but there is a unity of being. And he indicates that subtly there. They needed encouragement and strengthening. You know, they needed that in light, of the, in light of the alarm that they had experienced over this false report that Jesus had already returned. Well, that had, you know, everybody was then like thrown for loop. What is it? You know, our whole concept of the Christian faith and the religion and what we've been taught has now been thrown for a loop. And so they needed encouragement and strengthening and they also needed it as they pursued the Christian life in the face of a hostile populace. You know, it's not easy living for Christ in a culture that says there's something wrong with you for doing it and that resents it and ultimately winds up punishing you for it to try to get you to come off it. You know, whether it's just uh, ignoring you or pressuring you in jobs and all this kind of stuff, all the kind of difficulties that they would have felt socially uh, and, and so they need strengthening and encouragement. We need strengthening and encouragement. And so Paul's talking about that. Now the clause in, in the second part of verse 16, where he says, who loved us and gave us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, that probably refers to God the Father, but it's possible that it refers to both the Father and the Lord Jesus. But this love, whether it's the Father only or both of them, this love was expressed most pointedly, of course, in the incarnation in the cross. Right? In God the Son becoming the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth. And then his drinking the cup dry, his going to the cross and yielding his life for me and for you. And so this is where this is shown, uh, expressed most pointedly. That gracious gift, and that, that is a tremendous and gracious gift that provides for the faithful, eternal encouragement or comfort. I mean, what, what can compare to that? Right? What, what can possibly compare to that? And it also provides the good hope of eternal life in the glorious final state. That's where you and I live. As we face life, go through life, these people are living and having all kinds of pressures and things. Christians throughout history have done that. But you and I look beyond that. We are looking to a life, an eternal life, that is going to be one of absolute fulfillment. And we hold to that. As we limp along and struggle and face hardship and sorrow and suffering and death and all that, we know that a day is coming. You see? Well, day is coming. And I used to say, and I've said in here too, that on that day, we'll be hugging one another and talking about, you remember gathering in the group here in the auditorium? You remember, here we were trying to strengthen, trying to encourage one another, trying to keep each other, hold on. And so it's just going to be a celebration like none other. And it's going to go on and on. And it will be completely fulfilling. Okay, completely fulfilling. You won't get bored. You won't bum out. You won't say, I want somewhere else. You're just going to love it. Okay, just going to love it. All right, he says in 3, 1 to 5, Furthermore, brothers, pray about us so that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified as indeed it was with you, and that we may be delivered from evil and wicked men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the perseverance of Christ. So he says here in, in verses 1 and 2, now nearly all the English translations, I mentioned this earlier in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, they render the opening words here as finally which suggests that's the last topic of the letter. But as I said then, with regard to 1 Thessalonians 4.1, the meaning of that word, of those two words, it's more flexible than that. And it can function simply as a transition to something new, so I opted for furthermore. And the NIV goes, as for other matters, Shogren in his commentary says, beyond that. And I think that that's, 
works better for modern English speakers. Now, the missionaries asked for prayers on their behalf. I've talked before about how Paul, he's a spiritual giant, just a rock, and yet he asked for prayers for people. Shogren says about that, he says, to Paul, one of the obligations that his disciples bore, having received the message of salvation from him, was that they pray for the gospel's advance into other areas. And he cites some texts where you see that. People might also pray for other aspects of the apostles' work. For example, Paul asked the Romans to pray that he will also be able to deliver the Jerusalem offering and then visit Rome. The author of Hebrews asked for prayers to be released from prison. So Paul wants them to pray for the spreading of the gospel and pray, pray for them. They specifically ask for prayers on their behalf. He says, so that the gospel, the word of the Lord, may spread rapidly and be glorified as it was with you. And it's glorified when people take it and go, oh, you see, that's glorifying the word because you're saying this is something great. And so he wants them to pray that as they spread this message, that this message will be received as it had been received by them. And the prayers are for the missionaries because God has chosen human instruments for the spread of his saving message. Now, you can ask him why he did that when you see him. But he has chosen human beings to be the agents of the spread of this message. He doesn't instill the knowledge of the gospel directly into people. Could he do that? He could do that. But he doesn't do that. He has called that, called that message, called us to be ambassadors and deliverers of that message so that it is spread by human contact. You see, it's spread that way. I mean, all the conversions in Acts involve a human messenger. Even Paul had Ananias come to him. That's how God has designed this. That we are the means for the spread of this message. And God wants his gospel to go throughout the world. You see that in Matthew 28 and 18 to 20. He wants it to be accepted by all people. For example, in 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 6, 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 John 2, 2. He wants it to go into all the world. He wants it to be accepted by all people. But he knows that many will reject it. You can see, for example, in Luke 13, 22 to 27, Matthew 7, 13 to 14. But he wants it to go. And he wants people to receive it. And we are the means of that. And so Paul is praying that as we go about that, pray that that word will have its effect and it will be honored that people will receive it. And so it's just interesting to see the, the things that occupy Paul in prayer, the things that he's interested in. And they ask for prayers that they may be delivered by God from evil and wicked men, specifically the opponents of the gospel. The opponents of the gospel who persecute them as they evangelize. You know Paul's history, where he's been, what's happened. He goes somewhere, he's preaching, it's being received. Crowd gets stirred up and they drive him out. And he's saying, you know, this is, he doesn't want the gospel to be impeded and he's asking that they pray that they be protected from wicked men who are opposed to God's work in this world. I don't know how they dress it up. I don't care how they dress it up. If they are opposed to the spreading of this message, they are opposed to God's work in this world. And he says, pray that we'll be protected from that because he doesn't want his evangelistic effort to be impeded because he is serving God who wants the message to go out and he wants all people to respond. So that's what he's talking about. Then in verses 3 and 4, he encourages them. He says, the Lord is faithful to his word and to his disciples so he can be counted on to strengthen them and to guard them from the assaults of Satan. That doesn't mean that they'll have no hardships. They're having hardships now. You see, that's never what, what the protection is. A guarantee that you will be insulated from any suffering or hardship or persecution. It's never that. You see, it's never that. 
It means they'll be protected during those things. Satan cannot prevail against those who are faithful to Christ. He cannot. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. So as you hold on, even death, you will be victorious even in death. Nothing. He, he can't win. And that's what he's saying. He will protect you. You see, you may get buffeted and all this stuff going. You may even be killed. But who wins? You do. Why? Because the Christ is greater and he's won the victory. You cannot be separated. That gift will not be taken from you. And I think he's encouraging them with that. And people need to hear that. Because you see people get tempted. Oh, no, no, I want it. No, never let go of it. Never let go of it. The whole game that's being run on you by the enemy is to get you to surrender your faith. It may look like there are other things, but that's the ultimate objective. I want you to abandon your trust in Jesus. You don't do that, and nothing, nothing can harm you in the ultimate sense. Nothing can harm you in the ultimate sense. They express their confidence in the Lord's working in the Thessalonians' lives that they are doing and they will continue to do the things that the missionaries command. And that anticipates what he's going to say in verses 6 through 15, this exhortation regarding idleness. So he's telling them, look, he has confidence in the Lord's working in their lives that they're doing and they will continue to do. And then he's going to tell them again about this stuff with, with uh, people not working which he brought up before. And in verse 5, the prayer that the Lord, referring to Jesus, will lead the Thessalonians into a growing appreciation of God's love for them. Now, isn't that a great thing? Isn't that what we, what we need? Is a growing appreciation of God's love for us. Won't that change us? Won't that bear fruit? As you and I have a greater and greater appreciation of God and how much He loves us, well, won't that transform us? And so this is what he's praying, you see. He says that they'll have growing appreciation. They'll increase in their love for God. They'll increase in their love for each other. And he prays that they'll, they'll grow in, into an even greater participation in the perseverance or the endurance of Christ. You look at endurance, you say, well, what's, what's the endurance of Christ? Look at the cross. Who endured? Who went through so much? bore so much and remained faithful and steadfast throughout. So you see this prayer that you will be in the endurance of Christ, in the perseverance of Christ. Well, he's like a 10. So that's how we're to be. As you get pressured and you get beaten and you have difficult things and you have to hang on, you see. That's how you're to be. Persevere. Endure. Be faithful. And that's what Paul wants from the Thessalonians. And then in 6 to 15. Now we command you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To keep away from every brother walking in idleness. And not according to the tradition which they receive from us. For you yourselves know how you must imitate us. That we were not idle among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and toil, we worked night and day so as not to burden any of you. This was not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order that we may present ourselves to you as an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if anyone is unwilling to work, not unable, unwilling to work, do not let them eat. Now that sounds in our culture, that's, oh, that, well, you know, that, that's anti-Christian. This is Paul, this is the Spirit of God. But he says here that if, you, if anyone's unwilling to work, do not let him eat. For we hear that some are living among you in idleness, not being busy at all, but being busy bodies. Now such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to work with quietness and eat their own bread. 
But you, brothers, do not become weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this letter, take note of this person so as not to associate with him in order that he may be ashamed. Yet do not consider him an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now the missionaries, they had previously taught, they'd previously taught that as Christians, they're not to live in idleness, but they're not to be that way. They're not to be unwilling to work. So just say, look, I, I just, I'm able to work. I could work, but I don't want to work. Well, hey, join people. Uh, you know, that's why they call it work. <laughs> Not a lot of people say, hey, yeah, it's great. No, but that's what we're called to do. We are to work and to be productive. And they taught this both, the, the, the missionaries had taught this both when they were with the Thessalonians. You see that in chapter 3, verse 10 here. And in their prior letter in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. This is serious business. And as I noted regarding 1 Thessalonians 5.14, the adjective that's used there, and these are all cognates, there's an adjective that's used, there's an adverb that's used in two verses, and there's a verb that's used. But they're all cognate terms. Okay, and as I pointed out in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, that the adjective that's used there, it has a general sense of being disorderly, unruly, insubordinate, out of line. That's the general sense of the word. But there it probably carries this more specific nuance of disorderly with respect to work. Being out of line with respect to what Paul had called them to do. Being insubordinate with regard to the command that they work. Meaning they're being idle and they're being lazy. That's what it means there. And you see that, in fact, it's rendered that way in a number of the standard English translations to bring out that contextual nuance of disorderly. You see, so you'll see that in like four or five of the translations. Render it that way, the way I've done it here. And I think that's significant. Now the specific, you see the same thing, it's true of the adverb. In, in verse 7 and 11, you see the, the, the verb in verse 7. Or the adverb here and in 11 and the verb in 7. Now the specific manifestation, let's say, of walking disorderly that Paul has in mind is this insubordination, this disobedience of what he has told them and commanded them with regard to the need for them to work just as Paul did. Paul said we had a right to take stuff. We had a right to support. Why do you think we didn't use it? We didn't use it so we would show you you needed to imitate us so that you would work and not sponge off the church. It is a temptation. Anybody who's been plugged in at all with any kind of church leadership knows how many people think the church is a piggy bank for them to just not work or do stuff. Now, does that mean that there aren't needy? Of course there are needy people. Of course there are people who are unable to do things. But if you think that everybody who seeks money from the church is somebody who's not, you know, they're all unable, that's not true. <laughs> that is not true. I could tell you stories. And I have fairly limited experience. I suspect somebody like Terry who'd been around a long time, different churches. He could fill a long list of stories. You see, and it's not right. It's not right. And he's telling the Christians here, listen, you're not to do that. You're not to, you're not to be that way. So he has in mind that insubordination regarding the instructions to work and not to sponge off the church. And the translation brings that out with idleness and not to be idle. I think that's right, and as I say, like the Revised Standard, New English Bible, Revised English, New Revised, NIV, ESV, they're in accord with that. They think that communicates better now. Now, those who refuse to accept this instruction, he says they were to be avoided. They were to be avoided. As explained in 3.14, the main purpose of the discipline was to shame the offenders into compliance. That's not the only facet or aspect of church discipline. We see elsewhere that it serves to keep the church pure. 
that the church, the community of Christ, can't have within it impenitent sin. Somebody who's sticking their tongue out at God. And the church just gathers around them and says, we've become more loving than God. You see, we can teach God some things about tolerance. The church can't do that. You see, it's wrong to do that. Despite what our culture says. The culture is not a friend of the church. The culture is not interested in helping the church to be what God would have it be. It's interested in destroying the church. But he tells them here, see, that, that, that the one who, who refused to accept it is to be avoided. The church cannot shrink. It's very tempting. But the church cannot shrink. From its God-given responsibility to discipline wayward members, sin has to be taken seriously in a community of believers. It's not spiritual to wink at sin. It's not spiritual to do it. It's an affront to God to treat sin for which Christ died as though it's no big deal. That's, a, that's right, you know, we're just, we're just really loosey-goosey tolerant. We don't want anybody to think we're, oh, dare they think we're judgmental? Oh, that'd be the worst thing in the world. So not to be seen that way, we will allow blatant sin to go on, impenitent sin. Are we talking about people who are weak and struggling? No. We're talking about the impenitent who refuse to repent of their sin. By definition. That's what we're talking about. You know, in, in Revelation, the Lord's charge against the, the church in Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20 is that what? They tolerated a false prophetess who was leading Christians into immorality and idolatry. His charge is that they tolerated it. That wasn't a badge of honor. We think that the, anything you slap toleration on, well, that makes it, you know, that baptizes it and makes it wonderful. No, it depends what you're tolerating. You can't tolerate rebellion against God. Weakness all day long. Struggle all day long. Rebellion, no. There's a difference there. 1 Corinthians 5 makes it abundantly clear that the church has an obligation to withdraw ultimately from the impenitent. You know how it works? The person is urged, he's called, he's pleaded with, the person says no, 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 no church has to send him out. Now, why is that? It is not because it's unloving. It's not a hissy fit. It is for the benefit of that person. Like he says here, that they may be ashamed. It is God's ordained way of drawing them to repentance. And we think we know better than God. We think, no, no, that's not a good way to draw them. You say, well, I'm going to go with the Bible. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. It is the loving way to draw them to repentance. Does that mean they will all repent? Of course it doesn't. But it's God's ordained way of loving them in their sin to get them to repent. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Now he says in verses 7 to 9 that they'd set an example for the church by not sponging off them when they were in Thessalonica. They had not done that. They stayed at least part of the time in Jason's house. You see that in Acts 17, verse 7. But they paid for what they were provided. Now they're doing that for a reason. You see, they're setting themselves up as a model because presumably they understood the temptation of once you have this community of people that are all about helping and serving and loving, that you will attract parasites. And so he's saying that is not how you are to be. If you are able to work, you must work. You see, you must work and earn rather than burden the church. And that's an important thing. You see, they, they, they have to do that. So they stayed there. <clears throat> they said they were at Jason's house, but they, they paid for what they were provided. They refused to become this economic burden on the church, even though they had a right as preachers of the gospel to be supported by them. So they just wouldn't do that. And then he says in, ver he says in verse 10, when they, were, when they were in Thessalonica, they commanded that, that if anyone is unwilling, and I stress that again, and see, so I never want to have somebody who really is unable and who needs 
to feel like, well, I can't go to the church, that would be a crime. You see? If you're truly unable in need, Christians are eager to help you. But there's a difference. That those aren't the people Paul is talking about. Is that clear? Do you understand that distinction, right? It's, it's, it's people who are unwilling, who are just playing the system. And a Christian has no business doing that. Absolutely none. He says that they commanded that if anyone's unwilling to eat, do not let him eat. Now why is that? Because giving food to the one who's unwilling to work feeds his sin. We, we know about this idea of being an enabler. Right? You see that with alcoholics. You see the, the phrase, you're enabling that. Well, you don't want to enable the sin of sloth by giving to the person so he can continue to be lazy and despond. You don't want to do that. It's not right. It's not noble. It's wrong. Okay? So he says, do not let them eat. Why? That will then give them an incentive to go work as they are able to. So he says this to the church. And I think there are big messages here. He tells them that. It's not loving to do that. You see, we are stewards. And we have a responsibility to use the thing God has given us. You see, so here's the situation. You cannot do that. You cannot do that, and Paul tells them. And in verse 11, he said they'd heard that, that despite 1 Thessalonians 5.14... Despite that, there were idlers among the Christians. And with so much time on their hands, they're being busybodies. And the phrase I use, they're pot stirrers. They're not working. <laughs> Everybody else out working. And so what are they doing? Well, they're just bopping around, mowing and getting in people's business, seeing if I can say, oh, did you hear about this? Well, let me go over here and tell you. Yeah, I'm just over here. And you just see what Lois was doing? And Lois, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. And I'll go over here and I'll talk over here. And this is what they're doing. And he says, you're not to do that. So you're to be somebody who's out here, who's working, they've heard, we told you. And yet you're, we hear that some of you are idle, you're not busy, you're being busy bodies. And that's what he's saying there. They're to work with quietness, meaning they're to work and in that mind their own business in this sense. Does that mean you're saying Christians aren't involved? Of course Christians are involved with each other. What he's talking about is this way I'm trying to portray as pot stirring and causing trouble and being a busybody in that negative sense. is not caring for one another, not loving one another, not knowing each other. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this negative kind of thing of stirring up strife and trouble and doing that kind of thing. Because they're not working and they've got time on their hands, they can do this. So he throws that in. You need to be working and not being doing this thing you've been doing and being busybodies. So he tells them here, mind your own business. Work and mind your own business there. And in 13, don't become weary in doing good. Those doing, doing right are not to lapse into the kind of conduct that he's talking about. Right? I mean, as you say, look, you know, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but as you live your life trying to obey, do right, analyze your life, think about your life, make decisions based on how you understand. You know, year after year after year after year, you can see somebody needing to say, don't get weary. You see, don't get weary. You who are doing right and have been doing this, of course they haven't been at, at this that long, but you who are doing right, don't get weary as you see other people who are gaming the system. Don't get weary in doing always do right. You always do right. And so he's just encouraging them there not to grow weary. And then he says in 14 and 15 that the idlers are now, are, are now to be avoided and don't associate with them. And the only other use of this word in the New Testament, associate, is in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9 and 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. The context here is clearly disfellowshipping. You see, and that's what he's talking about. See, presumably the idlers have had ample opportunity to repent and have refused to do so. I mean, Paul would never say to somebody, well, there's a guy who's doing this, we'll just cut him off, that's it. No, you would always go because our goal, we want one another to be better, higher, nobler, more Christ-like. So we would always go and say, 
Paul has written this already in 1 Corinthians 5. We're telling you, Paul said it when he was here, you have to stop this. You have to stop this. You can't continue sponging off the church, being lazy. These people are saying, okay, they've reached this point now. He doesn't spell all that out. But I think that's clear what's going on. They've reached that point. They've had ample opportunity. They've refused to do so. And now he says, don't associate with them. Why? So that they'll be ashamed and they will then be pulled to come back. You see, they will lose this bond and this fellowship. They will be ostracized nobly. There's nothing wrong with that. You see, it's not hateful. It's not mean. Because you're trying to pull them so that they will wake up and say, Oh, man, the whole community recognizes that I have been doing wrong. Man, maybe, you know, maybe I, I really need to rethink this. Okay? That's the idea, and I think that's what's going on. Then in 16 to 18, he says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give peace to you at all times in every way. The Lord be with all of you. The greeting of Paul in my own hand, which is a sign in every letter, I write, it, I write in this way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Now, the, the prayer that the Lord of peace will give peace to them, that certainly is fitting on the heels of the instruction to discipline the lazy and the meddlesome members of the church, right? I mean, is that ever easy? That's never easy. Does that create tumult? It always creates tumult. As Wyma says, he says, Paul expects that his commands to discipline wayward members will cause internal tensions and thus praise in an emphatic manner that the Lord of peace will give peace to the Thessalonian congregation. And in adding, when he says, at all times, and in every way, the prayer looks beyond this disturbance of peace that's likely to flow from this immediate instruction to disfellowship the slothful and meddlesome, and it looks to these other disturbances of peace that are alluded to in the letter. To quote Wyma again, he says, The prayer for peace, therefore, also looks back to the reader's fear connected with the increased opposition that they endure from their fellow citizens, 1, 3 to 12, as well as the anxiety connected with the false claim about the day of Christ. So he says in all ways, so this idea of peace, may the God of peace give you peace through all the tumult I can anticipate as you live out my instructions. And also through the tumult that I see of your life being pressured and you being persecuted because you're a Christian. Lord, give them peace in that. Give them peace in their doctrinal disturbance if somebody's come in and said that we were saying this when we weren't and it's upset them. Give them peace. In every way, in all the situations, may God grant you that peace. And then the request, the request for the Lord to be with them, it's a request for his blessing on them as they carry on a life of faith. May he be with you in that way. May he bless you. Now Paul points out that he's appending a greeting to the letter in his own hand. Now this was common for Paul. You can see it in a number of places. He refers to it in 1 Corinthians 16, 21, and Galatians 6, 11, Colossians 4, 18, Philemon 19. He oftentimes doing this, and what he's doing, they have a, he would have a secretary, I don't know if always, but commonly he would have somebody who's actually writing. And so, is it in Romans where he says, Tertius, who's doing the writing, comes down and says, he gets to throw in his greeting. But so Paul is dictating, and there may be times he gives the, uh, the secretary more leeway, but it's still Paul's, whatever they're writing, Paul takes it and assumes it, right? I heard that, just let me finish this. This person is called an amanuensis, but Paul says, look, here's how I write. And I suspect that Paul's particularly interested in doing that here because of this possibility that there had been a fake letter. That somebody had said, well, Paul has said that it already came. Now, you don't know where that came from, but one of the possibilities was it was a forged letter. So Paul points out, hey, man, <laughs> you see, this is the real deal. 
I do this in all the letters there. That's how I do it. And his final words are an invocation of the Lord Jesus' grace on all of them. Let me finish with this. Gordon Fee says, Grace is the one word in Paul's vocabulary that embraces all that God has done and that he desires that God will do for his Thessalonian friends through Christ Jesus. Two weeks from today, Lord willing, we'll start Galatians. Thanks. <laughs>